I'm really fond of the old Jerome Kern, Oscar Hammerstein song that goes, I can't dance, don't ask me. Only, as I suspect a number of you may already be thinking, that isn't exactly the way the song goes. The title of the song is, I won't dance. And the lyrics go, I won't dance, don't ask me. I'm not sure when I confuse the lyrics or how I manage to remember can't dance from a show-stopping song and dance number performed by Fred Astaire, who somewhat famously could dance. Of course, it may be that my misremembering dates not from watching Astaire and Ginger Rogers in the 1935 musical Roberta, but instead dates from the equally memorable performances by Kermit and Miss Piggy in an episode of The Muppet Show. And after all, some confusion may be understandable here, since it seems that the original lyrics for the Jerome Kern Oscar Hammerstein version of I Won't Dance were completely rewritten by the songwriting team of Dorothy Fields and Jimmy McHugh, and it's their lyrics we remember, or in my case, misremember today. And indeed, even though it is Fred Astaire who sang the song in Roberta while spectacularly dancing, the lyrics do at least hint at problems with dancing, including, I won't dance, why should I? I won't dance, how could I? Now, if you're wondering why I've suddenly gone all musical trivia on you, there is a reason. You see, I can't dance. Absolutely no sense of rhythm. Oh, sure, I can shuffle around enough to fake it for a minute or two at weddings, bat mitzvahs, anniversary celebrations, and the like, but I simply can't dance. And to judge from the anguished admissions I kept coming across on the Internet when I was trying to track down the song whose lyrics I so tellingly misremembered, I'm not alone. The number of my fellow sufferers, all of us rhythmically challenged, is legion. Moreover, I was grateful to discover that I am far from being alone in misremembering I won't dance as I can't dance. Indeed, many of the references to this song on the web make that very same mistake. But here's the funny thing. While my sense of rhythm is pretty close to hopeless when it comes to dancing, or even to clapping in time with music, I think I have a very good ear for rhythm in prose. I recognize it even when reading silently, think I do a good job of invoking it when I read prose aloud, and I can be equally hypnotized by the gentle and carefully crafted rhythms of prose written by Virginia Woolf, or the sometimes manically varied prose rhythms found in the fiction of Thomas Berger. Listen to this justly celebrated, exquisitely measured passage from Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. Quiet descended on her, calm, content, as her needle, drawing the silk smoothly to its gentle paws, collected the green folds together and attached them very lightly to the belt. So, on a summer's day, waves collect, overbalance, and fall, collect, and fall, and the whole world seems to be saying, that is all, more and more ponderously until even the heart and the body which lies in the sun on the beach says to that is all. Fear no more, says the heart. Fear no more, says the heart, committing its burden to some sea which sighs collectively for all sorrows and renews, begins, collects, lets fall. And the body alone listens to the passing bee, the wave breaking, the dog barking, far away, barking and barking. And here are two very different sounding sentences from two of Thomas Berger's novels. The first is from his classic Little Big Man and is in the inimitable voice of Jack Crabb. As I say, none of us understood the situation, but me and Caroline was considerably better off than the chief because we only looked to him for our upkeep in the foreseeable future whereas he at last decided we was demons and only waiting for dark to steal the wits from his head. And while riding along, he muttered prayers and incantations to bring us bad medicine, but so ran his luck that he never saw any of the animal brothers that assisted his magic, such as rattlesnake or prairie dog, 
but rather only Jackrabbit, who had a grudge against him of long standing because he once had kept a prairie fire off his camp by exhorting it to burn the hare's home instead. Second example is from Berger's retelling of the matter of Britain in his Arthur Rex, and sounds more than a little bit like Sir Thomas Mallory, but like a Mallory who has just mastered the cumulative sentence. Now the abominable Sir Meliagrant took Guinevere to a kingdom that was not very distant from Britain, but was cunningly concealed, tucked into a valley amongst mountains, entrance to which could be gained only by one pass not easily found, and before this pass was a rushing river over which was but one bridge, the narrowest in the world, for it was made of one long sword, the weapon of a giant, the which was mounted horizontally, keen edge upwards. I've chosen these particular passages to share with you to suggest the range of prose rhythms we can hear in Wolfe's finely architected prose, Berger's mastery of American vernacular prose rhythms, and Berger's ability to invoke the sound of Sir Thomas Mallory's prose, but in a book whose prose is also thoroughgoingly modern. Notice that these passages are rhythmical, but not musical, or even metrical, the result of the way each proceeds forward in steps rather than of syllable count or meter. As Ursula K. Le Guin reminds us in her delightful writing text, Steering the Craft, quote, the sound of language is where it all begins and what it all comes back to. The basic elements of language are physical, the noise words make, and the rhythm of their relationships. This is just as true of written prose as it is of poetry. Or, as Virginia Woolf so perfectly put it in an excerpt from one of her letters, an excerpt that Le Guin cites, style is a very simple matter. It is all rhythm. Once you get that, you can't use the wrong words. Now this is very profound, what rhythm is, and goes far deeper than words. A sight, an emotion, creates this wave in the mind long before it makes words to fit it. My writing students may at first roll their eyes when I tell them that a sentence they've written needs an extra beat or needs to be slowed down or speeded up, but they almost always agree with me once we start working on the sentence. And once I get them thinking about prose rhythm, they credit that not only with helping them improve their own writing, but also with making their reading more enjoyable as they start finding delight in writers at the level of the sentence that may help them understand why they are attracted to a writer's larger characteristics such as plot or theme or character. What's funny about this seeming contradiction I find myself in, no sense of rhythm when it comes to dancing, pretty good ear for rhythm when it comes to prose, is that the topic of prose rhythm is tremendously more complicated and tremendously less understood, much less agreed upon, than is the topic of rhythm in dance or music or even in poetry. Questions about the nature of prose rhythm are even peskier than our questions about the nature of prose style. And, of course, there's every reason to suspect that prose rhythm plays a very important role in determining prose style, whatever we decide prose style is. Accordingly, I'm going to focus this lecture on the oh-so-important but oh so unsettled topic of prose rhythm. It's too important for me not to mention it, too complicated and conflicted for me to do much more than suggest some of the complexities. So I'm going to give a very brief overview of the history of attempts to study, measure, explain, or theorize prose rhythm. I'm going to offer a couple of ways of thinking about the importance of prose rhythm and finally, I'm going to offer a very modest way of thinking about prose rhythm in the cumulative sentences we've been working with, including a very, very modest model for describing the rhythms of some cumulative sentences. As is frequently the case with matters pertaining to rhetoric and poetics, Aristotle seems to have been one of the earliest to weigh in on the topic of prose rhythm. Aristotle laid down a kind of golden mean law that prescribed, quote, Prose should not be metrical, nor should it be without rhythm, end of quote. As he explained this dictum, quote, 
Metrical prose is unconvincing because it betrays artifice, end of quote, and also because it, quote, distracts the hearer who is led to look for the recurrence of a similar metrical pattern. Once prose, end of quote, once prose becomes metrical, it becomes predictable, Aristotle argued, leading even children to anticipate what will come next in highly metrical prose. So far, so good. Most of us would agree with his reasoning today, even though our attitude toward artifice and language, our understanding of the range of metrical patterns, and our sense of prose rhythms are all almost certainly quite different from those held by Aristotle. It's what he said next that still proves problematic. Quote, prose without rhythm is formless, and it should have form, but not meter. The indefinite and formless is displeasing and cannot be known. Prose then must have a rhythm, but not meter, for if it has meter, it will be a poem. The problem is that after saying prose rhythm should not be metrical, Aristotle then goes on to discuss prose rhythms in exclusively metrical terms, just as if he were discussing poetry, referring to the heroic rhythm driven by dactyls and spondees, the conversational rhythm built into the iambic foot, and then to the paean with its parts in a ratio of two to three, none of which I'm going to try to explain, because it is all hopeless hooey. First of all, when we try to transfer Aristotle's pronouncements about rhythms in Greek prose to rhythms in English prose, and second of all, because prose rhythms are simply too diverse, too variable, too unpredictable to be treated metrically, at least in the same way that we analyze poetry in terms of feet and syllables, stressed and unstressed. And yet, the history of attempts to analyze prose rhythm are largely prone to doing just that, dividing prose passages into feet, marking accented and unaccented syllables, and identifying the meter revealed by the scan in exactly the way we identify the meter of poetry. Aristotle may have started us down this unproductive path, but it was British critic George Saintsbury who more than any other single authority doomed us to this approach with his 1912 magnum opus, History of English Prose Rhythm. Not only did Saintsbury largely follow Aristotle's lead, but he scoured the books for even more esoteric meters than those usually discussed in poetry and swelled the list of possible prose rhythms with impossibly arcane meters such as amphibroch, melosus, proselusmatic. Saintsbury's efforts to describe English prose rhythms marked a period in the early decades of the 20th century during which there appeared a veritable stampede of theories and studies of rhythm in general and of prose rhythm in particular. Somewhat typical was Albert C. Clarke's lecture, Prose Rhythm in English, published by Oxford in 1913. Clarke held, quote, for the origin of prose rhythm we must go to Cicero. Nature, he tells us, has placed in the ears a register which tells us if a rhythm is good or bad just as by the same means we are enabled to distinguish notes in music. Men first observed that particular sounds gave pleasure to the ear, then they repeated them for this end. The rhythm of prose is based on the same principle as that of verse. This in ancient prose was the distribution of long and short syllables. In our own tongue, it is the arrangement of stressed and unstressed syllables. A related attempt to describe prose rhythm in metrical terms was associated with Morris W. Kroll, whose 1919 The Cadence of English Oratorical Prose and 1966 book Style, Rhetoric, and Rhythm advocated identifying prose rhythms according to a typology of clause endings used in medieval Latin. To the Latin meters identified as planus, tardus, velox, and trispondaic, Kroll added some new endings he thought he had discovered in English prose. Once again, I hope you'll understand why I'm not going to try to explain this system. Beyond noting its almost desperate desire to tie contemporary English prose rhythms to the classification system used in an ancient language that was not English. 
Even more desperate seeming is the longing in these attempts to find a way of describing prose as essentially regular in its rhythms, with one particular beat or meter predominating throughout a single piece of prose or the prose of a single writer. This, notwithstanding the repeated unflattering references from Aristotle to the present, to Greek audiences that found the rhythms of some Greek orators so predictable they could not resist beating time like dancers with the speaker, not apparently from any wish to ridicule him, but unable to resist the temptation and infection, claims Saintsbury. While classical commentators from Aristotle to Quintilian to Cicero seem to agree that variety should be at the heart of effective prose rhythm, those commentators seem hopelessly tied to the notion that variety should occur at some level higher than that of the sentence, whose feet must necessarily manifest some regular meter after the manner of poetry. Of course, today much poetry no longer regularly manifests meter, which makes it even harder to understand the persistent efforts to describe prose rhythm in terms of poetic meter. Apart from simply accepting and passing along the assumption that prose rhythm is essentially just a watered-down version of poetic rhythm, most early 20th century efforts to describe rhythm and prose managed to agree that very little agreement exists in their enterprise. E. A. Sonnenschein began his 1925 study, What is Rhythm?, with the somewhat discouraged observation, quote, the large number of works on meter and prosody published during the recent years in Europe and America bear eloquent testimony to the existence of a worldwide interest in the problem of rhythm and to a deep-seated dissatisfaction with the results hitherto arrived at by the inquirers. For it is evident not only that there is no accepted theory of rhythm in the field, but that there is no common understanding among inquirers as to the very nature of the thing called rhythm. Attempting to rectify this sad state of affairs, Professor Sonnenschein finally gets around to offering his own definition of rhythm. Quote, Rhythm is that property of a sequence of events in time which produces on the mind of an observer the impression of proportion between the durations of the several events or groups of events of which the sequence is composed." End of quote. Whew. Glad we cleared that up. But as generally unhelpful as I find this and most other takes on rhythm, I'm going to return to Sonnenschein's definition in just a minute to consider one part I think he got very right, the part that locates the order or pattern or structure of rhythm, not in the language of the speaker or writer, but locates rhythm only as that which, quote, produces on the mind of an observer the impression of order or proportion, end of quote. I'm not a student of prosody, but as far as I can tell, Sonnenschein's description from 1925 pretty much describes the state of agreement or state of disagreement concerning prose rhythms that we still have today. But not to worry. Remember that John Steinbeck quotation about spine counting? Metrical theories of prose rhythm strike me as the worst kind of spine counting. The good news is that they do give us labels for metrical phenomena we can indeed find on occasion in prose. The bad news is that those labels tell us absolutely nothing about the way prose rhythm works about the relational realities it establishes between writers and readers. And only slightly more productive are the related attempts to treat prose essentially as song lyrics and to describe it with musical time notations. Particularly for those of us who can't dance, this approach is not very promising. And while it may produce results for prose we widely recognize or identify as musical, it has little or no descriptive power for the vast majority of prose we encounter. Unfortunately, we don't fare a lot better when we move to the experiential end of the descriptive continuum, where descriptions of prose rhythm invoke the rhythms of nature and the rhythms of the Bible. The ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, the famous scholar's edition published between 1875 and 1889, 
has this to say about prose rhythm. Perhaps it may be said that deeper than all the rhythms of art is that rhythm which art would fain catch, the rhythm of nature. For the rhythm of nature is the rhythm of life itself. This rhythm can be caught by prose as well as by poetry, such prose, for instance, as that of the English Bible. Being rhythm, it is, of course, governed by law. But it is a law which transcends in subtlety the conscious art of the metricist and is only caught by the poet in his most inspired moods, a law which, being part of nature's own sanctions, can, of course, never be formulated, but only expressed as it is expressed in the melody of the bird, in the inscrutable harmony of the entire bird chorus of a thicket, in the whisper of the leaves of the tree, and in the song or wail of wind and sea. I'm not sure what I gain when I trade in my metronome for the rhythms of birds and the wind and the sea, although I suspect it's a step in the right direction. And I've come across another step in the right direction of understanding prose rhythm in another early 20th century study. I've been fascinated by the approach and findings of William Morrison Patterson's The Rhythm of Prose, an experimental investigation of individual difference in the sense of rhythm. Patterson was an English professor at Columbia, and his study, aided by the Columbia Department of Psychology, was published by Columbia University Press in 1917. His study was supplemented by voice photographs of the wave patterns made by recordings of subjects uttering certain words and phrases, including poet Amy Lowell reading from her own verse libre poetry. What strikes me about the Patterson study is its emphasis not only on rhythm as an experience, but as an inherently subjective experience calling rhythm, quote, one of the most individually different of human experiences, end of quote. Patterson explains, quote, rhythm is tangled up with our sense of time and our sense of intensity, both of which are not only tricky, but multifarious, end of quote. He then followed this observation with a credo that sounds both modern and right some 90 years after he wrote it, quote, Nothing is more preposterous, therefore, than that an author, the organization of whose temporal impressions is confessedly vague, do I hear a faint hint here of I can't dance, should undertake to present to humanity at large a comprehensive and final statement on the art of versification. His own particular code might easily be read with interest as a document, but could hardly be expected to serve as a universal guide. On the other hand, it would be equally misleading for the experiences of an aggressively rhythmic individual with a relatively accurate sense of temporal value, strong motor reactions, and subtle powers of discrimination in pitch and stress to be set forth as if they were thoroughly usual. The psychologists have long since recognized that rhythm is the result of a complex process whose operation can never be reduced to any one short formula, end of quote. Apart from providing me with a useful and persuasive get-out-of-jail-free card when it comes to making systematic pronouncements about prose rhythm, Patterson also gives me a couple of terms I want to put to my own use. You may have noticed his reference in the quotation I just read to, quote, an aggressively rhythmic individual. According to Patterson, Rhythmic experience, rather than so-called objective rhythm, is what we should be studying. And rhythmic experience tends to vary from individual to individual, with the aggressively rhythmic individual, the one who has, quote, the ability to organize subjectively into a sort of rhythmic tune, any haphazard series of sounds, provided they are not too close to be distinguished, are too far apart to be held together in one wave of attention, end of quote. Or, to put this bluntly, rhythm is what we make it, something we construct rather than something we find or something we discover. This is what I found so promising but unfulfilled in Sonnenschein's definition of rhythm as 
that property of a sequence of events and time which produces on the mind of an observer the impression of proportion between the durations of the several events or groups of events of which the sequence is composed. That's the first thing I want to borrow from Patterson, the idea of the aggressively rhythmic individual. I may be at sea on the dance floor, but when I read prose, particularly when I read prose aloud, I don the mask and cape of the aggressively rhythmic individual and I create in my reading the rhythms I most value. The second term I want to borrow from Patterson is one he applied apparently in some desperation to the way Amy Lowell read her poetry. Noting that her reading of her free verse emphasized phrases rather than feet or meter, he suggested that her reading reminds us, quote, gently but inevitably, this is a phrase, this is a phrase. Lowell's free verse, Patterson concluded, lifts us necessarily out of prose experience. What is achieved as a rule in Miss Lowell's case, Patterson claims, is emotional prose, emphatically phrased, excellent and moving, spaced prose, we may call it. You will not be surprised to learn that in Patterson's reference to Lowell's insistence, this is a phrase, this is a phrase, as well as in his reference to her spaced prose, I hear an opportunity to invoke once again both the cumulative sentence and Josephine Miles's understanding that, quote, prose proceeds forward in time by steps less closely measured, but not less propelling than the steps of verse, end of quote. What I realized is that for me, prose rhythm is a matter not of feet or regular metrical beat, but of steps. The sound a sentence makes each time it takes a step forward with a phrase or a clause. And of course, I've made no secret of my fondness for the particular kind of step forward the cumulative syntax urges us to take. And unlike my feelings on the dance floor, where I always think I'm missing something everyone else is hearing, when it comes to prose style, I think I hear or at any rate, I think I create rhythms everyone else is missing. The big difference is that my lack of a sense of rhythm in dancing comes from my perception, right or wrong, that regularity is the name of the game in dancing. But when it comes to prose, I figure variation is the name of the game. And just as prose guidebook after prose guidebook tells us that the key to effective prose rhythm lies in varying the length of our sentences, I think it equally true that the key to effective prose rhythm lies in varying the length of our phrases or steps within the sentence. And the cumulative sentence, quite apart from its distinctive backward and forward conceptual rhythm, its ability to backtrack and downshift to greater levels of specificity and detail, invites, indeed encourages, variety in the length of the cumulative phrases we add to the end of the base clause. Noted fiction writer Harold Brodke once began an essay with a wonderfully suspensive sentence, sometimes in New York, I can create a zone of amusement and doubt around me by saying that I was a Boy Scout. As it happens, much the same holds true for an English professor at the University of Iowa. I mention this because the very modest way I'm about to propose for thinking about one of the prose rhythms we find ourselves using when we write cumulative sentences is directly tied to my experience as a Boy Scout, an experience as a Boy Scout with Morse code. Most of us recognize distinctive rhythms in prose, but have never stopped to think about them in terms of the relationship of the long and short steps by which our sentences move forward in time. One way of thinking about these rhythmic relationships is to compare them with the da-da or dot-dash rhythms of Morse code. For example, writers who use cumulative modifying levels frequently alternate between long and short modifying levels with a single word producing the effect of the Morse code dot. Thus, slowly he opened the book, thumbing through its pages, stroking its cover. Might be thought of as dot-dash-dash-dash. And that rhythm can be compared with that of he opened the book slowly, thumbing through its pages, stroking its cover, or dash, dot, dash, dash. Each rhythm slightly changes the sentence and can create almost hypnotic effects 
as we can see in this great sentence from the great Gatsby, slenderly, languidly, their hands set lightly on their hips, the two young women preceded us out onto a rosy-colored porch, open toward the sunset, where four candles flickered on the table in the diminished wind. Dot, dot, dash, 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 dash. Thus, we might get a sentence, he sprang to his feet trembling, more excited than fearful. And we might ask ourselves how the rhythm of the sentence might actually change its meaning were we to move from the dash dot dash rhythm of the version I just read to the dot dash dash version of trembling, he sprang to his feet, more excited than fearful. Or the dash dash dot version, he sprang to his feet, more excited than fearful, trembling and so on through all the possible positionings. To be honest, I'm still not completely sure what use we make of the insight that cumulative sentences seem to become more dramatic when they alternate longer steps with very short single word steps. But I'll guarantee that once you have this pattern pointed out to you, you'll start noticing it in more and more cases, a device used by a wide range of writers. And you may want to start utilizing this or other simple rhythms in your own writing.